Well, you're going to hear some resonances, I think, in what I have to say with the two previous speakers, but I was really wishing I'd brought my slides with me of uh, weddings, wild events and other sleepovers, etc., at the <laughs> National Library, including when we opened our International Treasures Exhibition in 2001, people brought their sleeping bags and we opened, end up, ended up opening 23 hours a day to get through enough people to see that exhibition. And they did. They slept all around the National Library like it was, you know, trash, trash park or something. It was amazing. So um, with that, I will move to my provocations because Karen asked us to start with some provocations that might get us thinking. And these are some provocations that I hope I might be able to unravel for you that you might arrive at by the end. So my first provocation is that specialness is not preciousness. My second is that we need to revalue re and empower our specialist expertise. In other words, value our people, not just our collections. Um, integrate the common, triage the special and risk manage the rest. And the last one, it's all about the user, online as well as on site. So some Australian context first, because context is a bit different from the sum of the, that you've been listening to about special libraries in universities. The Commonwealth of Australia is a federation of six states and two territories, each with its own state library and library network. National and regional collaboration emerges from the, this political landscape, from economic necessity and, of course, from our remote geography. Now, in 2008, the National Library of Australia, the National Library of New Zealand and the eight other libraries, state and territory libraries, together embarked on a fundamental reform program to reimagine our libraries. We built a trusted framework for collaboration on projects that could achieve jointly more than each library could on its own. Projects are aimed to align a suite of services, collection control and collecting initiatives that would enhance collecting and access, but most importantly provide users with a more consistent experience across the geographical and institutional divides. Our Faster Access to Archives report of 2010 uh, was based on a major survey of archival collections across Australia that drove change in the direction of more product-less process, and it was one of those early reimagining libraries projects. Now, the drivers for our second phase of reimagining libraries, 2012 to 2016, we have three key drivers, one library, accessible collections, and enabling people. Amongst the 15 projects currently on offer, we've just done recent national surveys and quantified and looked at qualitatively some of the challenges for maps and pictures collections. And I've just been co-chair of the Pictures National Survey. And we've explored the challenges to increase discoverability and access, drive more content online, to create more digital capacity, and indeed to cope with the analogue avalanche of collections in the wake of the global transformation to digital mapping and digital photography. Now, the National Library in Canberra has national collecting responsibilities, including for legal deposit and for collecting Australia's unique documentary heritage. Our special collections predominantly document Australia's cultural, intellectual and social life and its place in the world by collecting from national identities and organisations and around historical and contemporary topics of national significance. Of course, this includes the standard things, personal papers, organisational records, pictures, maps, music, oral history, folklore, ephemera, rare printed Australiana, and of course, web archiving. Our collections and services are freely accessible to all Australians and to the world. The state and territory libraries are generally responsible for collecting their own state's unique heritage and for providing reference services for their state as a whole. Australian state libraries are a little bit different from the US ones. You might say the State Library of New South Wales might be closer to, say, the New York Public Library. It's got that sort of quality around it. Now, the National Library also has a statutory mandate for national bibliographic services, coordinating the national database and services to libraries, including, most recently, that remarkable integrated discovery service, Trove, which I know some of you know about. Um, 
highlighting collections of more than 1,100 Australian libraries and more than 100 galleries, museums, archives and small historical societies. Trove links to more than 340 million resources across multiple formats, primarily relating to Australia or held in Australia. Now, the vast majority of these special, of special collections that you will discover in Trove are held in the national and state libraries. These pertain largely to Australia, but also include international resources collected over decades. For example, the National Library holds the largest collection of Asian language materials in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm repurposing a slide that Lorcan Dempsey uh, developed for OCLC, thank you Lorcan, um, in which he, um, using the WorldCat data, and which includes the AD, uh, Australian National Bibliographic Database, he's demonstrated the extent to which the National Library uniquely holds materials in Australia. And you can see on the graph on the left, that really represents the unique materials held in the National Collection, and of which probably we'd say more than half of that is special collections. I'll give you some idea of what we're talking about. By contrast, Australian academic libraries, with a handful of exceptions, hold relatively fewer special collections or collecting archives. Mostly they hold boutique collections resulting from particular research or teaching interests or from individual collectors or benefactors. And we often refer to them as our Cinderella collections precisely because of their relative lack of control, discoverability and public access. So, to move on, in accordance with the reimagining libraries philosophy and goals, the National Library of Australia is itself modelling a one library <coughs> philosophy. So, just give you a few examples of the current goals and projects that are driving towards this ideal. Well, we've already integrated our previously siloed pictures and manuscripts branches and their separate services and separate reading rooms into one. And we're developing e call slip requesting for these materials to put the last special collections materials to finally come into line or align with the ECRA e call slips for the whole of the National Library's collection. We're providing, going to provide integrated access to special collections in a specially designed, purpose built, integrated special collections reading room with high functionality, high status and high visibility. This is just a first architect design. We're just in the process of working out the new service models that will work around it. This is a special reading room that will serve both general and advanced research use of special collections, and it will have the technology to support simultaneous physical and digital access. We're providing increased access to special collections both on-site and online through a dedicated treasures gallery, through apps and other kinds of mobile solutions to transform the use of collections in new ways and new spaces. We've just released Forte, a sheet music app based on our digitised collections, which has gone feral, is what I could describe it as at the moment. <laughs> it's quite amazing. <laughs> online reference service and a copies direct service for people to request digital copies right across formats and across special collections through a single interface, subject of course to donor and copyright restrictions. We're supporting copyright and rights management information through an integrated rights information, rights management database, it's purpose built, and a donor and contacts management database that runs right across the library. We're building new digital library infrastructure to acquire, preserve and deliver digital collections that's agnostic to format and descriptive differences between collections. And finally, we're enhancing Trove as a single point of discovery for special collections right across the gallery, library, archives, museum sectors, leveraging Trove's capacity to support user interaction and contribution, including crowdsourcing, um, and to deepen and contextualise the research experience. By running an API over Trove, we're supporting release of open data sets for digital humanities research that's providing both new research content and as a laboratory for technical innovation. So, our one library concept, far from generalising or devaluing or dumbing down special collections, is aiming to repurpose, revalue and reimagine them, reimagine the special. So, our strategy is to enhance and sustain our capacity to collect and to provide access to special materials, 
to increase the number of donors, researchers and new audiences engaging with our unique collections, to support faster processing and better discoverability with improved infrastructure and automated solutions, and to explore new modes of digital creation, digital scholarship, innovative virtual spaces and uses. So our challenge is to embed our special collections right at the centre of our One Library concept and business, to educate more people across the organisation in what we do in special collections, to be much less precious about what we absolutely must do, what we ought to do and what we can let go of doing. And our goal really is to free up our time and resources to maximise our effectiveness as specialists to our whole organisation. So what are some of the key principles underlying our approach? Well, systems and infrastructure are not inherently unique or special. What we put in them is. So our task as specialists is to ensure that they cater for the particularity and the granularity of our special collections and the breadth of format challenges, processes and data. We need to provide the professional expertise that will make our generic one library solutions work for our purposes. Our specialist knowledge and practices should focus on the real needs of special collections. Namely, that's to make them more discoverable and knowable, to build donor relationships and engage researchers, to shape and animate our collections and explore the new. Our full-time expert staff need to focus on challenges and tasks that only we can do. Not on the operations that require generic skills, you know, retrieving boxes and scanning and IT programming, nor tasks that could be outsourced or contracted like freight or valuations or packing and listing. Where appropriate, too, we should create common processes and workflows across our collections, across our special formats and across our administrative divisions. In other words, reserve our specialist effort and approaches for the complex, the high-end, the difficult and the innovative. Now, these kinds of views are derived from both personal experience, my own personal experience, from the resource challenges we, like all of you, are facing, and indeed from user perspectives. They're also derived from our participation in that collaborative National and State, li State Libraries of Australasia consortium reimagining projects. And in 2012, a very particular experience that I had in leading a self-directed value management study of our manuscripts collection develop and manage, development and management work. So for the second half of my talk, I'm going to concentrate on this manuscript study as a case study. So to set the context. By 2010, the National Library had already driven or implemented almost all the recommendations outlined in that Faster Access to Archival Collections report <coughs> over a five-year period. We knew a great deal about our collections. We'd made extensive inroads into their control and management through a suite of changes in line with international practice. Yet by 2012, we still had increasing backlogs in offers and accessions, and we had considerably rising staff stress. So why? This had suggested that, well, maybe we'd been unable to sustain our faster access endeavours. Maybe we hadn't gone far enough in finding efficiencies and business change. Maybe demand was simply outstripping our resource capacity. Or maybe our changed approach was only a partial solution to the challenges. Probably, to be fair, a mixture of all of these. So in April 2012, the library engaged some consultants from Value Edge, a company with expertise in aligning people, systems and strategy. Their role was not to undertake a formal review of manuscripts but to assist us to study ourselves. And I am somewhat reminded of your beautiful slide when I recall the process. A key part of the success of the study, undertaken over three months, was the agreed principle that all staff at all levels were equally important in the value study and equally important and active in their participation. So this wasn't a hierarchically or externally driven study or review of their work. So our focus was on the value, to analyse the value of what 
we do, what it costs, why we do it, what must we do, and how best we could do it, based on a process of evidence gathering, of consultation, of analysis, brainstorming, and then clarifying our ideas. Now, to gather the data, initially we analysed all the work functions of the staff and we devised ourselves a very large-scale diagram flowchart and behind this sits, of course, a lot of very detailed documentation. We costed these functions in detail, both in terms of the percentage of the relative time we spent and the staff costs per function. Our consultants observed a rather striking fact, and they do work right across all sorts of sectors, not just our <coughs> sector. And that is that staff were undertaking so many functions at such a high percentage of their time, when typically in a work team you might get staff undertaking, say, two work functions at a very large percentage of time and many others at a very small percentage of their time. So this was really interesting to us. And the largest one, I don't know whether you can see, is the most time we were taking was accessioning our collections. Okay, I'm happy to share this detail with you if anybody wants to know how we arrived at it. Okay, so what did we find? Well, what we produced was an evidence-based study which clearly exposed that the amount of operational work required to meet that whole range of work functions, outputs and expectations was twice as much as the staff time we actually had available. Does that sound familiar? I got some resonant laughs. Okay, deep breaths. This number and level of staff could not sustain the ever-increasing number of offers, acquisitions and accessions, nor the increasing range of more complex work functions to meet library-wide strategic initiatives. You know, digitisation, digital collecting, digital preservation, digital access, public engagement, Enhanced rights management, enhanced relationship building. I think we've heard many of those over the last two days. Changing user expectations for online and remote access to collections and finding aids, together with donor expectations that we would have all that digital expertise, intensified the pressure points. So in this context, a seemingly daunting vista of ever-increasing offers and acquisitions challenged even our experienced staff who went by now somewhat battle-weary after five years of continual change and fatigued by inefficient technology and workflows, what we came to term operational endlessness. <laughs> that resonates too. <laughs> now, the study also found that the percentage of time currently spent on relative work functions did not, surprise, surprise, sufficiently align with the National Library's strategic directions, nor our one library priorities. So the time we spent by the, the, on accessioning, processing and managing collections was well in excess of the time we actively spent shaping and developing what are nationally significant collections. The largest proportion of the time we spent was on acquiring and making the uh, collections accessible to readers and senior staff were engaged in many operational tasks and unable to sufficiently respond to the new challenges and opportunities. Staff remained almost wholly occupied with the analogue avalanche and were unable to skill themselves or to cope with the looming digital deluge or the digital infrastructure that we were building. The lack of interoperability of our collection management system, and we do use Archivist Toolkit, with the ILS and other key library business systems was a major inhibitor to productivity, leading to inevitable duplication of data creation and huge inefficiencies. We had very little time to value add or share our collection knowledge or to publicly animate that co the collections. And we certainly didn't have time to train or share knowledge with others, nor build the staff's own capability to ensure a future sustainable and flexible workforce to best manage our archival collections. Now, out of this study, we've produced a really quite extensive report, and we are happy to share that report with you. It's got lots of findings and strategies and recommendations. I'm not going to go into the report, but if you do want it, talk to me. Um, be rather interesting to see if they're the same and do indeed resonate as well. So I'm just going to look at some of the general directions that's a bit different from what we were doing before. 
We are functioning the focus, or focusing the functions of our permanent staff on what only we can do and on what we must do. In particular, we are investing our specialist time and expertise to make one library business systems work for us, leveraging the mainstream functions to support specialist requirements and workflows. We are mainstreaming and integrating shared, common and like functions across formats and indeed across the library. We are contracting and outsourcing some others. We are improving flexibility, rotation and staff training to ensure a sustainable and more archivally aware and digitally competent future. We are redefining roles and responsibilities of staff and their levels of delegation. We are trusting staff right down the line to take appropriate initiative and judgement. We too are adopting a project-based and matrix management approach to our work, to our tasks and backlogs with designated time frames that break that operational endlessness cycle. We are developing generic processes and workflows to apply to most collections, say 80% of collections, reserving case-by-case -case problem solving for the complex, the difficult or the really special. And we are taking a more risk-managed approach to issues and decision-making, including challenging quite a lot of our professional assumptions. And finally, we are triaging everything. Okay, so had the study had no other consequence, it would have been valuable by itself as a moment to pause and reflect and to re-inspire staff by harnessing their engagement, initiative and ideas. We've created really a new framework that staff own with recommendations and an implementation plan of their own devising. Given that the report was evidence-based, argued strategically and supported by extensive documentation, the study presented a powerful business case by the team for repositioning manuscripts within the organisation. I'll skip over this bit, but what was come out of it is a business improvement project we got funded to do over 18 months. We've got seven phases, which you can see attack those key issues, 80 plus deliverables, and we're four months into the project. Okay. Our staff are very deeply engaged in the project, I should say. So what are some of the strategies we're using? Well, we're thinking about the user all the time, and indeed imagining that new specialist collections reading room and that digital access. We're streamlining everything we can in terms of workflows and processes, always thinking about if we do this for manuscripts, what can we apply to other special collections? We're ensuring our systems, data and processes interconnect in the chain of work functions, undertaking project improvements, all the time within the context of operational work and we're brainstorming, trialling, measuring and evaluating them all the time so we know how much they cost us. We're empowering and energising all the staff in the change process from the bottom up and engaging our own professional expertise. So this is not top-down, externally driven, we're not using other tools and strategies, we're using the ones that we've devised through our process. So have we had any wins yet? I'm only going to give you two tiny examples. Okay, we've already devised a new end-to-end -end acquisition management um, workflow system and system that can serve as both pictures and manuscripts. This includes uh, re redeveloping smart use of website forms for donors and repurposing our Ref Tracker, which is our reference inquiry tracking system, to use it for acquisitions. So this is going to help us and automate our data and our tracking of interactions with donors from the very beginning to the very end of the point of acquisition. And along the way, we're capturing their collection information and all of our rights information. We can export this in XML into AT, so we reckon we're going to cut our registration and uh, re registration processes in half. By implementing the project um, and matrix approach to, to attacking our accessions backlog, we're running about five months ahead of the schedule we had set for ourselves in terms of tackling the backlog based on the previous cost model that we'd worked out. So to conclude, we've been drawing on our own professional expertise to generate business improvements that will reposition special collections. Our strategy is to better align the collections with the strategic directions of one library. We're embedding the collections and their management at the heart of our processes, systems and values using evidence to argue for the appropriate resource allocation. We're empowering and energising our staff. We're better engaging the whole community of staff, our users and our public audiences, so they can recognise and understand the unique documentary heritage and research value of our special collections. 
and in this context, we're really reimagining special collections into the future.